In today's lesson, we're going to be going over that of the life of the prophet Jeremiah. We have already went over verse by verse the entire book of Jeremiah, verse by verse commentary, basically. So if anyone would like to check that out, feel free. Now, whenever one begins to look into the life of the prophet Jeremiah, you'll quickly notice that his life is not laid out in chronological order. So there may be some disagreements on the timeline of when this happened, when this occurred. But all in all, I think that we got it pretty much right. Jeremiah 1.1 begins like this. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Now, Anathoth was a neighboring town. It was a priest town about six miles away from Jerusalem. Though Jeremiah did not grow up in Jerusalem itself, he could see Jerusalem from his little hometown. Verse 2 continues, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of Josiah's reign. As one can see on this chart, Josiah's position among all of the Davidic kings that ruled over Judah at that time, and if you'll notice, he's the 16th king out of 20. So Jeremiah is called during the absolute darkest days of Judah. And if you'll notice to your right, the circled portion, 722 BC, fall of Israel, Assyrian captivity, the northern kingdom has already been taken almost a hundred years before Jeremiah's ministry begins. So unlike most of our other studies, there's no need to go into detail as to the two kingdoms that made up Israel, one of them has already done away, leaving only Judah at the time of Jeremiah. But for any of you in whom would like to know details concerning that division of kingdoms, then you can check out our King Jeroboam study, the first ruler over the northern kingdom of Israel and his two golden calves that he set up. So for this study, there's no reason to even mention any of the northern kings, so we're going to focus primarily on the kingdom of Judah. So Jeremiah was called in the 13th year out of the 31 years of the reign of Josiah. Now we go on to mention Josiah's son in order to get better context in verse 3. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now Zedekiah would be the final king at the time of the Babylonian captivity until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So Jeremiah will begin preaching about halfway through the reign of Josiah, all the way through the Babylonian captivity he'll live through and beyond that. And we'll get into those details right here in just a moment. King Josiah was the last godly king of Judah, leading up to the Babylonian captivity, which would occur only 22 years after Josiah's death. If you'll remember, King Josiah was so moved by the Lord that he caused a huge reform and revival to occur throughout Judah. By the Lord giving Judah one of their most godly kings, plus sending his best prophets like Jeremiah to preach to them shows that God gave Judah every advantage needed to stay on the right path, but most refused. Jeremiah was given very difficult messages to deliver, beginning with repent but ending with surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and patiently dwell in Babylon, the exact things that the people did not want to hear. By Jeremiah's time, the nation had already sinned beyond measure, especially during the reigns of King Ahaz and Josiah's grandfather, King Manasseh, who were infamous for placing idols within Solomon's temple. And even though Josiah did a great job in attempting to cleanse all of the horrifying evils that his grandfather Manasseh had brought about upon Judah and Jerusalem. Even though he did such a great job in trying to cleanse this, it had already been profaned over and over again by that point. So much so that in Jeremiah 15, we read about this, And I, the Lord speaking, and I will cause them, the people of Judah, to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, because of Manasseh's sins, they were so evil for that which he did in Jerusalem. We do have a video where we go over this reign of King Manasseh, exceedingly evil, then repentant. So if any of you would like to watch that relatively short video, feel free. Verse 4 then continues, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Notice how Jeremiah is called a prophet unto the nations. 
Feinberg commented on that. In this respect, Jeremiah was appointed a prophet for a worldwide ministry. This refutes the idea that the work of God's servants was always provincial. God is the Lord of the nations. It's then that the Lord gives Jeremiah the vision of the budding branch of an almond tree to denote God's hastening the execution of the predictions, which he declared by this prophet who lived to see most of his prophecies fulfilled. And by this branch, having already, it's believed, budded, then that's the hastening. I'm going to do this quickly, Jeremiah. Then came the second vision of a seething pot pouring over the nations, representing the coming invasion from the north. The first chapter of the book of Jeremiah ends like this, And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Meaning, I'm giving you a very despised message, and people always want to kill the messenger, and they try to kill Jeremiah many times. Now, this naturally frightened Jeremiah because he was young. He even makes note of how he's just a child. Though we are not told the exact age of Jeremiah when his 40-year-long ministry began, he does refer to himself as a child, leaving scholars to estimate him at about 17 years old. Over the next 18 years, Jeremiah would go about preaching with relative ease. As the godly king Josiah was still reigning and the people's hearts were more open to worshiping God. Once Josiah died, however, assuming Jeremiah was 17 years old when his ministry began, the prophet would have been well-prepared, very known, and of a more mature age, around 35 years old. It's also important to note how the first six chapters of the book of Jeremiah may have been the central message he conveyed to the people during those years, in essence, the first half of his ministry, which was basically a call to repentance for the most part. In chapter 16, God tells Jeremiah that he will have neither wife or child. As such distress would soon fall upon Judah, that such fruitfulness would be a curse. To have a child would be a curse, because you would likely see them starve to death or be killed in the war or carried off or used against you for whatever reason. It's believed that he was told this in Josiah's 18th year as king of Judah, making the prophet about 22 years old whenever God said, you're not going to marry, you're not going to have children. After King Josiah's death, his son, Jehoaz, began to reign in 608 BC. Now this would be about three years before the first stage of the Babylonian captivity would begin. There are three stages to the Babylonian captivity, beginning with 605 BC, Scripture tells us how after only three months, King Jehoaz was replaced by his brother Jehoiakim by Pharaoh Necho because the Egyptians kind of had rule over Judah at that time. They had just killed Josiah. It would be during the 11-year reign of Jehoiakim who would succeed his brother Jehoaz after only three months. And apparently he was more willing to bend the knee to Egypt, and that's the reason why Pharaoh probably replaced his brother with him so quickly. But it would be during the 11-year reign of Jehoiakim that Jeremiah would begin to experience ever-increasing persecution. Jehoiakim, all of these final four kings after Josiah, all of them outright evil. Though the timeline is not laid out quite so clear in Scripture, it is believed that Jeremiah is then ordered once a Jehoiakim takes the throne. As chapter 7 and 26 denote, that he's ordered to preach at the temple gate, possibly during one of the busier feast days. And we know that he did this at least twice. He probably preached at the temple multiple times in order to gather and to have the largest audience possible. By this time, however, after Josiah's death, the people were already beginning to backslide very, very quickly back into idolatry and all of their horrible ways. Jeremiah 26 tells us about at least one of these instances where he preached at the temple, and it could have very well have been this one. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house, meaning Solomon's temple, 
This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. You see, the Jewish people believed that because the house of the Lord was located in Jerusalem, it would always be protected by the Lord. But by now, the Lord had said, you have profaned my temple. You have done all. So there's just this giant reset button being placed upon all the nations, not just Jerusalem, but all the nations by this Babylonian captivity. Nevertheless, the hand of Achim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Only one or two people would ever be there to spare his life. God would move. Only one or two people. The rest of them wanted him dead. Shortly after the reign of Jehoiakim began, we're not told specifics right here, but shortly after Jehoiakim began to reign, it's believed that Jeremiah had pronounced doom upon the surrounding nations. And in chapters 48 and 49, you can read about those. This would have been around 609 BC, likely about four years before Nebuchadnezzar would actually invade the land. So he's telling all the nations, all of you just surrender to Babylon and you will live. If you don't, you will die because you're actually fighting against God's will. And this was the very dire message that Jeremiah had. And I can't reiterate this enough, really, because then you begin to understand chapters 11 and others like it and how it tells us of a conspiracy to kill Jeremiah which the Lord brings to the prophet's attention. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, why are they trying to kill Jeremiah? Why not just, you know, tell him to shut up or just not listen to him? Well, he's weakening the hearts of the people, and they're starting to see how we might as well just give up and surrender to Babylon. And these detractors, these enemies, these false prophets are preaching a whole nother message, like Joel Osteen. Everything will be just fine. You know, when you see the volcano in the background erupting and he's just, ah, it'll be, yeah, everything's perfect. The prophet was then commanded in chapter 18 to go to the potter's house to learn a visual lesson of how God can take an old lump of clay as Israel and make something new with it. The Lord then commanded Jeremiah to take one of the pots down to the valley of Hinnom which would be the place of child sacrifice during those times, likened unto Gehenna, the lake of fire. Jesus even points to that to reference the lake of fire. And Josiah really, he just desecrated the place with dead bones so that people would stop sacrificing children and other things unto demons down there. So Jeremiah, he takes this vessel and he breaks the pot in front of them that he calls down there, these nobles, these captains, these rulers, because they just allowed it to happen. Many of them probably even participated in it. So he breaks the pot in front of them, proclaiming, I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the flesh of his friend in the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. He's talking about during the siege of Babylon and how they're going to starve so badly that they will begin to commit evils that they did not want to do. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no place to bury. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet, and put him in the stocks, much like this, that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. The next day, as we're told, Jeremiah was freed and prophesied doom upon Pasher and his house. Then did the prophet begin to lament his commission from the Lord whenever he finally gets alone. And he begins to be very saddened by this message and all the persecutions coming upon him. And it's just such a hard ministry. I believe that it's the most difficult ministry in the whole of the Old Testament. But Jeremiah begins to lament and says, I will not make mention of him, speaking of God nor speak any more in his name. So Jeremiah had a heart to just stop preaching altogether, which is exactly what the people wanted. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Meaning that he did quit preaching for a while. We don't know how long, but it was probably for, I would guess, a month or so or whatever. But then he just says, I can't just hold all of this in. The old Bible commentator Adam Clark actually commented on that verse. Jeremiah was obliged to deliver it in order to get rid of the tortures which he felt from suppressing the solemn message which God had given. And if you're a preacher, you know exactly how he's feeling right there. The Spirit of the Lord just moves you and you just have to preach. You have to preach. Paul the Apostle actually had this very same sentiment 
happening with him. And he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 9, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. About three years later, in 605 B.C., in the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar won the battle of Carchemish against the Assyrians and Egyptians, immediately followed by him being named King of Babylon. And it's around this time, shortly before Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judea, Jeremiah was commanded to offer wine to the nomadic Rechabites, who, though not Jewish, scrupulously obeyed the ordinances of their forefathers. So Jeremiah goes to these nomadic people that are well known for being very disciplined in their actions and their walk of life and keeping to the traditions of their forefathers. And he offers them wine. Upon their refusal to partake of the wine, God used their disciplinary restraints for an example to the Jewish people. And he says, look, these people are not even Jewish. They didn't even come up with the same traditions and laws as you have been privileged with, and yet they obey those traditions religiously. Almost immediately, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded Judea that very same year that he became king. He invades Judea, even Jerusalem, taking certain promising captives. He doesn't destroy the city or anything. He even allows Jehoiakim to remain the king, but he subdues them in this very first invasion, taking certain promising captives like Daniel and others back to Babylon, leaving Jehoiakim as king. So this is the first deportation where Daniel and others are taken to Babylon. This invasion of 605 B.C. would be the first of three separate deportations which would make up the Babylonian captivity, which would end in 586 B.C., which we'll come to right here in just a moment. Scholars believe that it was around that time, after the first deportation, that it was around that time that the drought mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 14 occurred. And remember, God said, I'll curse the land if you remain in idolatry and evil. Jeremiah then has the prophecies written down, believed to be much of those prophecies from chapters 2 through 6, that of repentance and of just obeying God, but almost certainly included the 70 years of captivity prophecy. And to be more specific, the 70-year prophecy went like this, Jeremiah 25, 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. After reading only a few of these prophecies, we're told how King Jehoiakim then cuts them up and burns them. The Lord then tells Jeremiah to write the scroll again and add a message to Jehoiakim that he would have no one to continue to reign in Jerusalem and that his corpse would be thrown out unceremoniously. You're going to die a very harsh death, Jehoiakim. That was in the fifth year of Jehoiakim. Now let's jump to the ninth year out of his 11-year reign. Let's go to the ninth year. Jeremiah was commanded to take an unwashed loincloth and hide it in a rock at the Euphrates River. Now, if you know anything about the importance of keeping your garments clean as a priest, you know that they were very, very important to the priest. But God says, no, do not wash this one. After many days... Assumed to be 70, we're not told how many days, but after many days, in accordance with the years the captivity would last, it's believed, Jeremiah was commanded to go and retrieve the loincloth which had become rotten by them. This was to be symbolic of Israel and Judah being once so close to God as the garment itself. Yet after leaving him for so long, they had become filthy and good for nothing. Two years later, in 597 B.C., the very same year of the second deportation, two years later in 597 B.C., in the eleventh year of Jehoiakim's reign, would Nebuchadnezzar once again invade Judea, killing Jehoiakim and replacing him with his son, Coniah. According to Josephus, not in Scripture, we're not told exactly how Jehoiakim dies, but according to Flavius Josephus, Jehoiakim was killed along with high-ranking officers. His body was unceremoniously cast over the wall of Jerusalem without a burial. During this second deportation, would the prophet Ezekiel and others be taken to Babylon? So now Daniel, he's been there for several years by that point. And now Ezekiel goes into Babylon along with others. So Jehoiakim is killed, his son placed upon the throne, but his son only reigns for three months 
After only three months, would King Coniah be taken captive to Babylon? Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar was probably a bit unsettled by the son of the man in whom he just had killed reigning upon the throne. Probably thought, well, disobedience is almost guaranteed from him. So instead, he takes Coniah to Babylon, leaving his uncle Zedekiah to reign as the final Davidic king of Judah. So now Coniah's uncle Zedekiah would reign instead. And as one can clearly tell from this chart, Zedekiah is the very final king to rule before the Babylonian captivity, and there's only 11 years left. The Lord then showed Jeremiah two baskets of figs, one filled with good, the other bad. The good represented those that had already been taken into Babylon. The bad, those that remained in Jerusalem, as well as the Jewish people dwelling in Egypt at that time. And it's believed that the reason why is because those remaining were the most resistant to God's command to go into Babylon. Jeremiah then sends a letter to the captives in Babylon, telling them to settle and patiently endure, as 70 years of captivity was their fate. You're going to be there for several decades, so just settle in. Because all of these false prophets in Babylon were telling them, it's all okay, we're going to be returned to Jerusalem at any time. God's going to overthrow this evil king Nebuchadnezzar and all of this. And Zedekiah was even going to attempt two or three times. He would go himself in person, but he would also send messengers in order and attempt to gain the freedom of those already taken, but it would be met with failure. We're then told how in the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign, the Lord commanded Jeremiah to wear a yoke with bonds upon his shoulders in the fourth year of Zedekiah's 11-year reign. The message was for the king as well as all the messengers gathered to him from the surrounding nations, as they would have apparently these meetings, those of Moab and Ammon and Edom, and all of these would meet up to say, what are we going to do about the kingdom of Babylon? You know, they're invading. What should we do? Should we attack, go to Egypt, what have you? So this message was for all of them to submit under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and they would live. We are then told how Hananiah, one of the false prophets, took the yoke from Jeremiah and break it, predicting that within two years would the Lord break the yoke of Babylon from off the necks of the nations. Jeremiah 28 verse 13 then tells us of the response, Go and tell Hananiah, the Lord says, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. Now you have hardened their hearts against God's will for them to surrender. Now it's going to be even worse for them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, Hananiah, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Scripture then goes on to tell us how Hananiah would die only two months later. It would be at that time that Zedekiah would set all the servants. He would actually do a very good thing, this King Zedekiah. It would be at that time that Zedekiah would set all the servants within Jerusalem free, all the slaves, you can all be free now, in accordance with the law of Moses, which had been so long neglected. According to the law of Moses, every seven years was known as a sabbatical year, free your slaves, okay? Though this act pleased the Lord and momentarily kept the people within the city safe, they would all shortly after break the covenant. The people, the slave owners, they would break the covenant, forcing the freed people back into servitude. Jeremiah thirty four seventeen then tells us of the Lord's response. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And that is a staggering prophecy right there, because he's saying, you did not give liberty to them, but I'm going to give liberty to the sword and to pestilence and to famine to fall upon you. We're then told how in the ninth year of Zedekiah, after a while of his outright rebellion against the king of Babylon, we're not told specifics regarding when he began to outright rebel, but... He had probably been in rebellion for a while, but it would be in his ninth year that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, would bring his final besiegement against Jerusalem, and he is very angry this time. We're then told how Egypt, who had kind of an alliance with Judah at that time, Egypt then brings an army and attacks Babylon, giving Jerusalem a brief reprieve, but false hope of salvation. They're thinking, okay, God, he's going to save us through the Egyptians. 
It would be during that period of brief reprieve that Jeremiah would be imprisoned and accused of colluding with the Babylonians. He actually tells us how he goes outside of Jerusalem for a bit of a break from the people and from preaching. And they capture him and they say, you're in collusion with the Babylonians. And he says, no, I'm not. And they throw him into prison. Then did Babylon return and resume their besiegement of Jerusalem shortly after. King Zedekiah would then have Jeremiah brought out of prison, secretly inquire of God's will, upon which the prophet would tell him that he would be, and I quote, delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. You will see the king face to face. Hide behind these walls as long as you like, but the Lord has already declared it. And this is the thing about King Zedekiah. He actually had a heart to kind of do what was right. And we see a bit of Pontius Pilate with him. He fears the people so much because the people, they hate Jeremiah. And as you'll notice, this was a secret meeting. So Zedekiah, he's in a rock and a hard place right here. So Jeremiah, he declares unto the king the prophecy of the Lord. He says, you will be taken by the king of Babylon yourself. Jeremiah then asked the king not to send him back to his former prison. Zedekiah then has him sent to the court of the prison where he would be fed daily. It was a much more comfortable atmosphere. While in the court of the prison, Jeremiah is offered his uncle's land in Anathoth. There's this piece of land in Anathoth, his hometown, and he's offered this land which the Lord commands him to buy. Now, if you know anything about wartime, you know don't really buy land or anything. You have no idea what's about to happen, especially in the ancient times. But the Lord commands Jeremiah, go ahead and buy it. The reason being, the Lord says, is to show the people that fields and vineyards would once again be enjoyed by them after the 70 years were completed. This was a sign. Jeremiah bought this land in order to show we will be brought back. Then would four of the princes of Judah gather together after hearing about how Jeremiah was in the court of the prison. Oh, he's in this comfortable little cell, much like Paul the Apostle in Rome. So they hear about him in this little comfortable cell, and he's being fed bread daily. Now, the city is running out of bread, mind you. And so that would have probably added to the animosity of these four of these rulers within Judah. These four would come up to King Zedekiah and convince him to have Jeremiah be lowered into a pit until he died. Their reason being that Jeremiah's message was weakening the courage of those remaining within the city. Look, his preaching is killing the hopes and the morale of the people. It's at that point where Jeremiah is near death, most likely. He's starving, and he's in this mud pit. An Ethiopian eunuch, though, named Abedmelech, then pleaded for Zedekiah to allow him to free the prophet before he died. The king allows him. Jeremiah would then be taken back to the court of the prison where he would wait out the siege. Not long after that would the city run out of food and begin starving. The siege itself would last about 18 months and near the last month or so would the people just run out of bread. And then you're talking about mothers killing their babies in order to survive. We're actually told about some of these atrocities within scripture out of sheer desperation. But such would be fulfilling the prophecy told before within the valley of Hinnom, how you will eat your sons and your daughters and all of this out of you. You'll commit evils you never even imagined that you would commit. Days later, would Babylon break through the walls? Zedekiah would attempt to flee, but be captured at Jericho. Nebuchadnezzar then ordered that the poor remain in Judah to till the ground. Jeremiah was officially freed at Ramah and given complete freedom. Jeremiah, on Nebuchadnezzar's orders, you may go wherever you like. Apparently word had reached the king of Babylon and told them about how the Lord had told this prophet to preach surrender unto Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar also, not a stupid man by any means, he knew that it was a hopeless endeavor to hold out against him. He could wait out a siege forever. So the prophet Jeremiah, he's freed at Ramah and he's told, go wherever you like. But King Zedekiah would be brought before Nebuchadnezzar where he would be forced to witness his sons being slaughtered right in front of him, then having his own eyes being put out and taken to Babylon. The very last thing Zedekiah would see would be the execution of his own sons. And if you'd like to see further details concerning this final king of Judah, we have a King Zedekiah study. 
One month later, in 586 B.C., would the Babylonian captivity be finalized with the burning down of Jerusalem and the rest of the captives taken to Babylon, all except the very poorest of the land. We're then told how Jeremiah would travel to Mizpah, which would be north of Jerusalem and above Ramah. Remember, he's freed at Ramah, and he just travels to Mizpah, where the newly appointed governor over the land, Gedaliah, was located. So Gedaliah, he begins to spread the very same message that Jeremiah had been preaching for years and years. And he says, look, we're all under the yoke of Babylon. Just settle, plant your vineyards, go about your business, all of these things. But not long afterwards would a man named Ishmael, along with others. Ishmael, believing he had right as the seed royal, part of the Davidic line, this Ishmael, he believed that he had the right to rule instead of Gedaliah. We're told how Ishmael, along with others, would assassinate Gedaliah at Mizpah, killing many more and taking those at Mizpah captive. So Gedaliah, he's killed almost immediately. Gedaliah's captain, Johanan, who had warned him about Ishmael, he said, look, this guy believes he has a right to rule because he's from the seed royal. And he actually says, let me kill him. And Gedaliah says, no, no, we trust him. He's okay. But Johanan, he's still alive. He wasn't present at the time of the assassination. But Gedaliah is dead. And his captain, Johanan, then gathered his men and pursued after Ishmael, who had fled with his men into Ammon, leaving the people that he had taken captive. He left those to return to Johanan. Then did the people, incredibly fearful at this point, because now the governor that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, they have had open rebellion against. He's even been assassinated, and some of the guards of Babylon have been killed. Oh man, they're incredibly fearful. They then turned to Jeremiah, inquiring as to their next step, as they feared the Babylonian response to Ishmael's treachery. After ten days of prayer, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, telling the remnant of Judah to remain in the land and not fear Babylon. The people then accused Jeremiah of speaking falsely and go against God's will, setting their sights on fleeing into Egypt. This they did, gathering all those of the remnant of Judah, as well as Jeremiah, whom they forced to flee with them into Egypt. And it's believed that they forced him as a type of prisoner, it's believed, in order to keep watch on him so that he may not tell any of the Babylonians within the land that would come down, so that he may not tell them or conspire against them or something, but they were keeping watch over Jeremiah and forcing him to go into Egypt with them, thus fulfilling Jeremiah 24, 9, and 10, that the whole land would be desolate. No one would be there to inhabit it. We're then told how Jeremiah began to prophesy in Tapanis, ordering people to bury large stones and clay in the brick pavement, at the entrance of Pharaoh's palace in Tapanes. Now this was for a sign unto those people, bury these large stones in the brick pavement. It would be upon those very stones that Nebuchadnezzar would very soon set his throne in Egypt, bringing the sword upon all its inhabitants. Look, you're trying to escape from Nebuchadnezzar? Right here's where he's going to set his throne once he kills everybody. Chapter 44 then tells us of a time a little while later when the Jewish people had fallen right back into idolatry in Egypt. 44 tells us how the people blatantly refused to hearken unto the will of God once again. And Jeremiah is preaching against worshiping the queen of heaven. And we're told about how the women, they're really emphatic on worshiping this queen of heaven. And the husbands are taking up for their wives and saying, no, just shut up. Don't tell us anything. It's the same thing over and over again. But this leads to further foretelling of doom upon them and Egypt itself. According to the early church writer Tertullian, the Jewish people stoned Jeremiah to death in Daphne, or Tapanes in Hebrew, in Egypt. Jeremiah's quote-unquote crime was telling them truths they did not want to hear. And now we know, my friends, why the prophet Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet.